So I'm going to talk about things that are a little more at the foundations of uh, geometry processing, some of the basic theory that really shows up all over different parts of geometry processing. And uh, that's the subject of conformal geometry, so looking at geometry through the lens of just the angles of the surface. So we're going to throw away all information about lengths and areas and just consider angles of the surface. And initially, this sounds pretty weird. This sounds like a pretty abstract way of looking at geometry. But it turns out, you know, if you really understand this deeply, that over time, this perspective can be very, very powerful for coming up with effective algorithms for all sorts of different tasks that we need to do in geometry processing, whether that's re reconstruction, filtering, sampling, compression, parameterization. You know, it's actually kind of surprising uh, how many of these different areas get, get touched by this seemingly weird idea of uh, angle-only geometry. And we'll, we'll kind of see why that's the case as we, as we go on. So I'm not going to talk actually too much about applications uh, in the remainder of my talk, but I thought I'd at least give some taste, some flavor of where and why this shows up. And hopefully, if you're sticking around for the rest of the week, you'll see at least a few talks where people are really uh, taking advantage of this, this point of view. So really, kind of the oldest application, if you like, of conformal geometry was making maps of the Earth, cartography. You want to navigate the, the globe. OK, well, the globe is round. I want to store a flat map. How do I do that? What's the best way to do that? And so lots of people thinking about cartography. Um, I think if you've been around in computer graphics for a while, when you hear the word conformal, you think, oh, yeah, yeah, texture mapping. OK, you want to map some image onto a bunny, right? And, and that's certainly one thing that people still uh, do. But really, conformal, the use of conformal geometry has grown a lot since sort of that period, late 1990s, early 2000s, um, to all sorts of other things, simulation, 3D fabrication, shape analysis, even things that are getting outside of the field of geometry processing and computer graphics, like laying out sensor networks. OK, so lots of, lots of powerful ideas here. Um, and since I gave the same tutorial last year, I thought I'd at least give a couple very, very recent applications where people are using conformal geometry in different ways, OK, not, not just texture mapping, but things that are, are really uh, opening the door to new, new places where these tools can be used. So one uh, that's becoming more and more popular is shape analysis. You'll certainly hear a lot about that this week. Uh, I have various uh, surface meshes or other descriptions of geometry point clouds, and I want to understand some relationships between them. So here's a very nice piece of work where the question is how to do an analysis of a large collection of shapes and understand their behavior from the point of view of evolution. So what you do is you go out and you scan in a bunch of bones and teeth from primates from different geological eras, and you want to understand something about the evolutionary tree of these primates just by looking at the shape. Right? So you get no additional information. What can you learn just by analyzing the shape? And so what's been done here on this paper mentioned at the bottom is, OK, we map all these surfaces to a common domain using tools from conformal geometry. We use this to do some kind of, and I say we, it's, it's uh, Patrice Cole and Joel Haas, uh, do some kind of comparative analysis, understand which shapes are similar to which other shapes. And amazingly enough, you can come up with a phylogenetic tree that looks a lot like what humans, real expert scientists, come up with by studying this by hand. So no landmarks, no additional data, just looking at the geometry. Uh, another thing that some of you may have heard about lately is people are getting really interested in, in deep learning, machine learning, right? And so when we, when we think about, well, how can we apply these techniques to geometry rather than images, I think it's still a very, very big open question. A lot of people asking, you know, what's the right representation for geometry when it comes to learning? Well, at least one path is to say we're going to map our geometry to an image. And here, conformal geometry has started to play a bigger and bigger role in coming up with effective mappings for that kind of problem. And also in uh, 3D fabrication, not the kind of fabrication that you just heard about in the last lecture, not additive 3D manufacturing, but there are, of course, many, many other manufacturing processes that still are very, very important. Um, and from a geometric point of view, you know, again, it, it comes back to this question of, well, how do I take a curved surface and effectively map it to a flat piece in a way that lends itself to easy manufacturing? So uh, here, if you come up with a high distortion mapping, you might not be able to recover the original 3D shape very well. So if I take, you know, want to make this uh, 
cow shape out of a bunch of pieces of paper. Well, if I have a very poor mapping to the plane, I try to reconstruct it, I get a poor reconstruction. If I can figure out a good way, an efficient and uh, kind of low distortion way to map this to the plane, then I get this much better reconstruction. And uh, these kinds of ideas of flat fabrication are showing up in all sorts of different domains. Uh, and, and you can really start thinking about the relationship between different models of flattening and even material properties. So if you have ductile materials, things that, uh, that fracture due to shearing, you really want this kind of conformal behavior. Um, finally, there's very interesting class of new materials uh, that people are looking at more and more, really metamaterials, what are called oxetic materials. And these are materials that behave a lot like the conformal geometry we'll study today. So when you pull on them, they stretch an equal amount in all directions. They have a negative Poisson ratio. And what that means is that if you have powerful tools for working with conformal geometry, you can also use those to design these new types of materials. Okay, so just a little taste of new and different stuff uh, people are doing with conformal geometry beyond the traditional texture mapping point of view. Okay, and that's, that's it. That's all I'm going to say about applications. Um, the rest of the time, what I really want to focus on is what are the fundamentals? What is conformal geometry in the smooth setting? How do we discretize it so we can compute with it? And what are some of the algorithms or algorithmic challenges that show up in this context? Okay, just a little warning. Uh, these slides are a work in progress. There will be errors on these slides. Uh, don't assume that everything I say is correct. If something seems completely crazy to you, raise your hand, ask a question. Uh, very, very likely that I've made mistakes, okay? All right, so just a little bit of overview. I said conformal geometry is the study of geometry just from the perspective of angles. And this really honestly was uh, motivated from the beginning by this problem of making maps of the Earth. How do you take the globe and flatten it so that you can make a nice map that you can store in the drawer of your ship? Um, well, it's actually pretty hard to do. People spent hundreds of years thinking about this problem just for the sphere, right? We want to do this for all sorts of interesting shapes, already hard to do for the sphere. And you may have uh, kind of encountered this challenge if you've ever tried to you know, think about, okay, I want to peel an orange and flatten out the, the peel. Well, if I try to do it in one big piece, that doesn't work very well, right? It doesn't flatten down very well. Maybe I could peel it along a spiral. That flattens out pretty well into the, in, onto the table, but now I have this long, skinny piece. So how can I just make a few cuts and flatten this out in a nice way, right? So, so in general, what you find if you play around with, you know, you peel a bunch of oranges, uh, you find that getting a flattening of the peel is completely impossible unless you do either have either have some kind of distortion you stretch the peel in some way or there's some kind of cuts or both right really you need both to do a good job um, the amazing fact is okay you can never eliminate distortion but an amazing and not really completely obvious fact is you can always 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 make a map that exactly preserves angles okay so you can always flatten out that orange peel in a way where, or let's say the surface of the Earth, so that east and north remain at right angles. And that's very useful, of course, if you're trying to navigate a ship, right? I know at least I'm going in the right direction. I'm going to get to my destination. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get there because <laughs> distances have been stretched out, but I know if I follow this course, I will get where I want to go, okay? The, the flip side is that areas can be badly distorted. And so if you look at the standard, this is the Mercator projection of the Earth. This is standard conformal map of the Earth. And uh, you may notice that Greenland looks like this massive continent, right? Millions of people living in Greenland. Australia, meanwhile, is this little island in the Pacific, much, much smaller. Actually, this isn't true. Hopefully you know that uh, Australia is bigger than Greenland, right? Um, North America is probably a little bit exaggerated in its importance as well, all right? Um, so... This is kind of the, the tension that's always there when working with conformal geometry. Angles are preserved exactly. You have to think about what happens to areas and lengths. Okay? Beyond just this question of making maps, right, making maps of the Earth, conformal geometry really at, a, at an abstract level is a study of shape when you only are able to make measurements of angle. So you have some shape. You can't take out your ruler, but you can take out your protractor 
and make angle, uh, angle measurements. And so then the question is, if I can only make those measurements, what can I say about that shape? What can I do with that shape? Okay. Just to give a little feel for you know, what conformal geometry is all about, this is just an assortment of pictures that show up uh, in conformal geometry, just to give a little bit of visual intuition. Okay, and these are the kinds of things when I talk about angle preserving maps or discrete maps that in some sense preserve angles, these are the kinds of things we're going to encounter. Okay, so why, you know, if there's all these different possibilities in making maps and stretching things out and cutting and so forth, why so much interest in conformal maps in particular? I've already given actually one very kind of profound reason, which is that there's always a conformal map. There's always something that exactly preserves angles. Right, and that's going to be true for all shapes, not just for the, the sphere. Um, but there are a lot of practical reasons. There's a lot of computational, numerical uh, reasons as well to approach geometry processing from the conformal perspective. Uh, one basic one is that conformal maps are automatically very nice. Right? So just by preserving angles, they're smooth. I'll talk about all of these in, in more detail in a moment. Um, simplicity. So working with conformal representations of geometry both can make implementation of algorithms very simple. It also makes things very simple when you go to write things down on pen and paper. The best uh, analogy is working with an arc length parameterization of a curve rather than some arbitrary parameterization. Uh, very, very efficient. So compared to many of the other kind of mapping algorithms you might see uh, out there these days, conformal algorithms continue to be kind of best in class when it comes to performance, solving sparse linear systems, solving easy convex problems, that kind of thing. And because this is such an ancient topic, because people have been thinking about conformal geometry for hundreds of years, there's some very, very well-developed foundations, which makes it easy not only to understand what's going on, but also to provide guarantees for algorithms. Okay, so just to go in, in a, more, a little more in detail, you know, I say conformal maps are really nice, what do I mean? Again, there's this idea that, okay, conformal maps preserve angle, and a, another non-obvious fact is that just by asking a map to preserve angle, that automatically forces it to be infinitely differentiable, forces it to be smooth. Right? So, so when it comes to algorithms and geometry processing, you know, there's always this question, what does regularity mean for discrete data? Well, if you have some notion of conformal for discrete data, you also, by extension, have some kind of notion of what it means for a discrete map to be regular, to be nice. Okay. Um, also, I said, okay, the, the kind of uh, Achilles heel of conformal maps is this scale distortion, but even that is fairly nicely behaved. So if you look at the scale distortion in a conformal map, it doesn't behave in an arbitrary crazy way, but tends to look something like a harmonic function, something that's very nice and smooth. Uh, as I mentioned, working with conformal geometry, let's say just on pen and paper when you're trying to work out expressions, makes life a lot easier. So if you, if you think about working with curves, you know, what's a natural way to write down a parameterization of a curve? I could talk about walking along this curve at all sorts of different speeds and parameterizing it in different ways, but why bother? I mean, th there's a very natural way to say, if I have like talking about time moving along a curve, I should move along at uniform speed, right? There's not really any good reason not to parameterize the curve in this simple way. Likewise, when, you, when it comes to surfaces, you'd like to have a parameterization like this. You'd like to be able to say, okay, if I move a certain distance on the map, I'm moving the same distance on the globe. If I have a certain angle on the map, I have it. unfortunately not true, right? We, si we said there's, there's always going to be some kind of distortion. So you can ask, well, what's the next best thing? What's the thing for surfaces that's as close as possible to being an arc length parameterization of a curve? And one pretty good answer is to say, oh, well, I can work in conformal coordinates. I can work in coordinates where I only have to keep track of distortions of scales, but not other things, shears and angles and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, you might also say, well, I don't know. There's lots of, you know, there's lots of things I could preserve. You said conformal maps are nice because you exactly preserve angles. What about maps that exactly preserve areas instead? Forget about this angle stuff. Let's just talk about angles or uh, uh, areas. And it turns out if you follow this path, you can certainly do it. You can talk about area preserving mappings, but they have a very, very different nature than angle preserving mappings. Right? For instance, they don't have this nice smoothness property automatically. In fact, they can be arbitrarily kind of nasty. And a good, and a good way of, of seeing this is to realize that um, water is incompressible. Right? So if I'm swirling water around, the surface of a water around, I'm really getting an area preserving maps sort of of the surface of the water. 
Yeah? And so I can start out with this nice surface of the pool, and I swirl it around, and I'm getting all this distortion relative to where I started out with. This is a perfectly area-preserving map, but looks really, really horrible. Right? Uh, in contrast, if we talk about what are, what are motions that exactly preserve angles, they're pretty rigid. For instance, if I take the sphere and I ask, what can I do to this sphere while exactly preserving angles? Well, I can't swirl it around, right? like I could swirl around the water on the surface of the Earth. All I can do is apply very simple transformations, they're called Mobius transformations. Right? So if you want to be a little more abstract about this, I have a finite dimensional reparameterization group here. I have an infinite dimensional reparameterization group here. This also matters from the perspective of shape matching problems or storing data. Okay, and, and so another way of looking at this, you could say, well, rather than saying, oh, I want to exactly preserve angles, I want to exactly preserve angle uh, areas, you know, maybe I can find just the right balance. Maybe I can find some really interesting energy, symmetric Dirichlet energy, something that really gives the right notion of what distortion means. And the reality is there's no magical solution. No matter what you try, no matter how you try to map some surface to the plane, if it has non-trivial curvature, there will be some kind of distortion somewhere. There might be some kind of angle distortion, there might be area distortion, right? But there must be some kind of distortion. So this is, you know, this is why it's kind of uh, important sometimes to, to study the fundamentals, to understand what's possible and what's not possible, so that you don't go off, you know, on a research project trying to discover something that can't be discovered, right? And so, of course, the other thing you should always do in research is say, well, if I can't solve my problem, I should try to rephrase the problem, right? So if, I, if I'm unhappy with the distortion here, okay, I can't get better, I can't get a better mapping of this shape to the plane, right? Oh, by the way, these grid lines, these grid lines are the lines that result from taking this and flattening it somehow to the plane and then just drawing the grid lines from the plane back on the surface. So if, if I can't figure out some intelligent way of mapping that gets rid of distortion, I can give myself more freedom and I can say, okay, I'm actually going to make some kind of cuts in the surface before I flatten it that reduce the distortion. Right? And this, this turns out to be, in some sense, a lot better way to eliminate distortion in mapping than trying to play around, futz around with your energy. Okay? Um, and if you kind of adopt this perspective and realize really it's the cutting of the surface that matters, and you realize, oh yeah, conformal is actually a pretty good place to, to start because conformal we know is it always exists, it's smooth, it's really e cheap to compute. So as long as I can find a good cut, I don't need to muck around with these other more complicated energies. Right? And actually I'll, I'll ask here, so, so these are three different energies. One of them is conformal, or three different kinds of flattenings. One of them is conformal, and the other two are by some more fancy, sophisticated, nonlinear optimization. Can anybody tell me which one of these is the conformal one? So, oh, uh, okay, so maybe raise your hand for the left. Raise your hand for the right. Raise your hand for the middle. Okay, so there is some confusion about it. There's also some people who know a little bit about conformal geometry in the audience, right? Why, so why do people think it's the middle? Sorry? Yeah. Well, don't they all look like squares? Oh, I see. But you're saying you can see a little bit of a rectangular stretch here, right? And the other thing you might notice is these, these got scaled down a little bit, right? There's a, a bigger variation in scale here. But not that much, right? If we go back, if we compare to what we had before, Right? Before we made these cuts, we had this huge variation in scale on the right. We had this huge variation in angle on the, on the left, too. We make these cuts, and okay, some people are, you know, some people are confused. It gets pretty, it gets pretty similar. Right? And so, yeah, the, the, the majority, uh, you know, that's how science works, right? The, the majority votes, and <laughs> that's, that's truth, right? So the majority of people voted for the middle. It is indeed the middle. Uh, and we'll come back to this point in a bit. But uh, yeah, cutting is very, very important if you want to get low distortion maps of any kind. Okay, another motivation for working with conformal maps is, well, it's very, very efficient. So from the point of view of geometry processing, conformal geometry processing algorithms often boil down to the best kind of thing you can hope for, which is to solve one big sparse linear system. 
Doesn't get that much. Doesn't get much better than that. Uh, or sometimes you solve some easy convex optimization problems. Um, on the flip side, you can have very sophisticated types of maps where you care about things like bounded distortion or being locally injective or globally injective. Uh, you can have all sorts of additional criteria on your map beyond just distortion. And in that case, there might be much more complicated problems you have to solve, second order cone prob uh, problems or simply you know, trying to minimize some non-convex energy. Um, and so whenever you go to solve a problem in geometry processing, you know, you really have to think about the trade-offs. Okay, do I really need these sophisticated properties, guarantees, and so forth? If so, then maybe it is worth spending all that extra time on computation. Do I need to do something really, really fast inside the inner loop of some other algorithm? Hmm, maybe I should try something like conformal where I can just solve a linear system, right? Um, and, and so, Conformal maps, you know, you can really think about in that kind of context. So things I can compute very, very quickly, and as we'll see, can behave very, very nicely. Um, which means if you're doing things in real time, or again, you're doing something inside the inner loop of some al other algorithm, might be a good place to look. Um, I just want to, you know, kind of comment on this because there will be more and more talks about injective mapping. I'm I suspect there are some at SGP. There certainly are at, at SIGGRAPH this year. So this has been a big trend in uh, surface flattening parameterization is this idea of, okay, we really want an absolute guarantee that when we compute a map from our surface to the plane, it's injective. No triangles flip over. I don't get any part of the surface flipping over any other part. And I think the, the dirty secret of these injective methods is that compared to you know, kind of the where we started with surface parameterization, we're getting to the point where we're tens or hundreds of times slower than these traditional linear methods, right? And I think the other kind of dirty secret is if you actually go and use these these linear methods, at least good ones, for a lot of surface mapping problems, you'll find it's actually quite rare that you don't have this lack of injectivity. Things actually work out really well most of the time. And so I think if you're trying to be pragmatic about, about you know, your approach to geometry processing rather than being dogmatic about it, um, you can get the best of both worlds, right? You could easily say, oh, well, conformal maps work really well. They're fast, so why don't I give it a shot? If it doesn't work out, sure, I can fall back on something that has stronger guarantees, right? So it doesn't have to be one or the other. But just to give one example, here's a pretty recent, you know, 2016 method for this injective mapping, really suited, uh, uh, targeted at performance, at making this fast, right? And this is taking 15.9 seconds versus, you know, 0.12 seconds, so about 126 times more computation to get this guarantee of injectivity, which you already got, right? You already got injectivity. You just your algorithm wasn't guaranteed to give it to you, right? So it's something really worth thinking about as you hear people talking about injectivity. Where and when should this be applied and how can I use it in conjunction with faster methods? Okay, and, and here's a really, really uh, interesting place where this kind of simplicity and speed of, the con of, of working with a conformal uh, representation really pays off, which is that you know, if, if I don't simply want to just compute a single map from a surface to the plane, but I actually want to optimize that mapping in some way, well, it really helps to start out with a simple formulation, a simple convex energy like what you end up with in conformal maps. So one thing that's very easy to do in the context of uh, conformal mapping is to say, okay, among all maps, please give me the one that has minimal area distortion. This, is, this can be done in a really straightforward way. More recently, some really interesting stuff you can do is you can say, okay, well, I feel like we've got a handle on how to flatten a surface well. What if I now want to figure out what's the best way to cut it to make the flattening even better? This is a very new topic, not a lot of work done on this at all. And if you work in the conformal setting, it becomes very, very easy to write down a nice uh, flow for optimizing this cut. You're seeing one example where we start with a random cut and kind of push it towards lower distortion. Um, or look for globally optimal cone singularities. I'll talk a lot about this problem of cone singularity placement in a little bit. So these kinds of global optimization problems are things that you really can't easily do with other kinds of mappings. Right? If, you, if, you're, if it's already really, really hard just to compute that one flattening, then you're going to have trouble solving these meta problems where you then want to optimize some other criteria about the map. Okay. So just a little bit of motivation for why the conformal perspective continues to be interesting even in 2018. Okay, conformal maps also help to provide 
uh, a lot of guarantees for algorithms. Again, because this is such an old subject, there's a lot of well-developed foundations for conformal geometry. Um, there's a lot of theorems and analysis you can fall back on. Uh, in terms of computation, it connects to standard computational problems like solving sparse Laplace equations. So if you, if you stick around in geometry processing for any amount of time, you'll find that solving the Cotin-Laplace system is uh, something you will do over and over and over and over again. Uh, it makes it easy to provide guarantees on what the solution looks like because you have things like the maximum principle for Delaunay meshes. And at a kind of more geometric, uh, from a more geometric perspective, you have things like the uniformization theorem, which says, I know for sure that there are always conformal maps to some canonical domain. This is, this is something that's been very powerful for shape analysis, shape matching type applications. Uh, not necessarily true if you're minimizing other energies. Is there always a canonical mapping? Can I always find it? Right. And kind of the crown jewel in this area is something called the uniformization theorem, which we'll talk about a bit more later. But roughly speaking, what it says is that the any surface of any topology, you can find a global conformal map, global injective diffeomorphism, redundant, to a space of constant curvature. So if my surface has sphere-like topology, I can find a conformal map to, some, to literally the unit sphere. If it has the same topology as a torus, I can find a mapping to a periodic grid, right, the flat torus. If it's higher genus, well, I can map it to a constant negative curvature surface, which I can think of in the hyperbolic plane. This one's a little bit uh, harder to think about. But this is what allows you to do all sorts of interesting shape comparison and analysis uh, type thing. One other thing that's occurred since I gave this tutorial just last year is a pretty major breakthrough in the theory of discrete conformal maps, which is now that there is that there is now a complete, complete and final uh, uniformization theorem for discrete surfaces. So the same statement applies. If you give me any triangulation whatsoever with any discrete metric whatsoever on it, doesn't have to be Delaunay, doesn't have to have any special condition on the edge lengths, then you can always compute a new discrete metric that's conformally equivalent and has prescribed curvature. Okay? Um, of course, to really say what this means, we'll have to talk a little bit later about what conformal equivalence means for triangle meshes, and we will get to this. Okay, so I've said a lot of really kind of sophisticated stuff, but let's let's get really down into it. Let's let's ask some basic questions and give some basic definitions about what conformal mapping is, what does it mean for meshes, and how do we compute with it? And if all you'd ever heard about was that conformal maps should preserve angles, then there's a very natural idea of, well, what, what does it mean to have a conformal map on a triangle mesh? Right? I have a triangle, it has angles, well, it seems very natural that a conformal map should preserve the angles of my triangle, right? What else, what else could I possibly ask for? Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, I know at least for a single triangle what should happen. It must be the case that every triangle gets mapped by a translation, a rotation, and a scaling, right? A Euclidean motion and a scaling, a similarity, because those are the transformations that will preserve angles. Actually, one thing, I, one thing I might also add here is orientation. I don't want the triangle to flip over, right? And that, that will be true of conformal maps as well. They're both angle and orientation preserving. Okay, so let's try it out. So here's a slightly larger mesh. It has three triangles instead of just one. And we're going to look for conformal transformations of this mesh. Okay, what do they look like? What can I do to this mesh? Well, preserving all the angles in all the triangles. David knows because he was here last year. It also says it on the slide, so somebody should be able to answer. What transformations can I apply to this mesh that preserve all the angles? I can scale it. Yeah, scaling it. Sorry? Similarities of each triangle. Global. Okay, why does it have to be a global similarity? Why can't I do different similarities to each triangle? Uh-huh. Right, exactly. Right? So if I apply a similarity to this first triangle, 
Well, I have to apply a similarity to the next triangle, and that similarity has to have the same exact scaling. Right? <laughs> and the third one, of course, has to have the same scaling as the second. So by asking that all the angles be preserved, the only thing I can do to this entire mesh is a global similarity. And what this means is that if I think of this as my definition of discrete conformal maps, this is way more rigid than it should be in the smooth setting, right? So, so I said before, oh, there's this uniformization theorem. No matter how crazy the shape is, I can somehow flatten it out to the round sphere. Well, if I can only apply a similarity to my bunny, <laughs> it will never look like a sphere, right? So, so as, as you know, straightforward as this seems, yeah, conformal, just preserve the angles, turns out to be completely the wrong way to look at discrete conformal maps. You really, really need a different perspective. And in fact, this is why this is such a, a, a kind of rich and beautiful subject, is that there are these foundations of conformal geometry where people have looked at conformal maps from many, many different perspectives in the smooth setting over the years. From the perspective of preserving angles, of scaling the metric, of conjugate harmonic functions, of preservations of circles, being critical points of the Dirichlet energy, there are all these equivalent characterizations of conformal maps in the smooth setting. And so when it comes to, okay, how do we compute with these things? How do we discretize them? Well, I can use each of these smooth perspectives as a different starting point, as a different guess for what a discrete conformal map should look like. And kind of the funny thing in a way is when you take these different, you know, equivalent starting points in the smooth setting, you actually end up with a whole slew of different inequivalent treatments of discrete conformal maps, of, of conformal maps in the discrete setting. It's, it's actually kind of funny. If you go through the list, okay, these are all the ways geometers, you know, traditional geometers have looked at conformal maps. Well, somebody's written at least one paper on each different way of thinking about conformal maps, right? Lead to very, very different uh, uh, discretizations, which lead to different algorithms, which ultimately lead to different trade-offs, different places that you'd want to use those algorithms. Right, so not just as simple as preserving the angles of triangles. So beyond looking at these different perspectives, uh, what we're going to talk about today are just some key ideas. These don't, these don't fit together in any completely obvious or natural way, but just different ideas that come up uh, often in conformal geometry, some of them very familiar, Mobius transformations, for instance, some of them much, much less familiar, uh, but have very interesting consequences for computation. Okay. So this is... Part two, there's a tiny little I next to the second I. This is part two. We're going to talk about the smooth theory. Yeah, Keynote did something totally crazy to my slides since last year, too. I don't know what happened. They upgraded Keynote. So. Um, okay, so just to, just to break it down a little bit, we're going to kind of go from easy to hard. We're first going to talk about conformal maps just in the plane, then conformally mapping surfaces to the plane, and then very briefly touch on conformal maps from curved surfaces to curved surfaces, the most general case. Now, one thing you might ask at this point is, well, why are we only talking about surfaces, right? We just had a whole lecture about 3D printing of volumes, and we also want to do conformal geometry on, on volumes. Well, there's a really, really important uh, fact about conformal maps, this Liouville theorem that says, if we're in dimension three or greater, the only angle-preserving maps from Rn to itself, or from a region of Rn to Rn, are what are called Mobius transformations. Very, very simple transformations that don't give you much flexibility over just similarities. Right? Not just a little bit beyond uh, similarities. And we'll get back to what these are exactly later. But the point is, conformal re geometry really shines in two dimensions. Surfaces or surfaces in three-dimensional space, surfaces in n-dimensional space. Okay. So let's talk about conformal mappings from the plane to the plane. Again, the basic geometric idea is we want to consider maps that preserve angles and orientation. Okay, and if you've ever taken a class on complex analysis, hopefully you know something about this because that was like the entire class, right? Uh, and you may have studied the fundamental equation for conformal maps in the plane, which is the Cauchy-Riemann equation, which we'll see in a moment. There's a lot I can't say here. I can't do a whole class on complex analysis, so I'm going to omit lots of views on conformal maps, but 
you know, dig into those. That's, that's where, you know, all sorts of treasures are hiding. Go back to your basic intro textbooks and then try to link them to computational and algorithmic thinking. You'll be amazed how much you find. Okay, so really, really elementary idea that we'll need to understand uh, these cauchy riemann equations is the differential of a map. Okay, so when I say a map, I just mean a function that takes me from one place to another. Right, so here the map f is going to take every point p, oops, point p in the domain to point f of p in the codomain. The differential of a map, forgetting all the symbols and, and so forth on the board, the, the differential says something very, very intuitive, which says, if I have a vector sticking out of the point P, what vector do I end up with? Right, so literally, if this was a piece of rubber and I drew with a pen a little arrow on the surface, and then I stretched out that piece of rubber into this new shape, what would that little mark that I made look like? That is literally what the differential does might be more familiar if you, if you know about the Jacobian, right? The differential of Jacobian, same idea. A little more formally, we could say, okay, we just, we just define it using standard definition of derivative from calculus, right? What is the differential of a vector x? Well, I start at the point p, I walk a little bit along the direction x, I get a point p plus hx, I see where that point p ends up, or that point p plus hx ends up, I take the difference, I divide it by h, I take the limit as h goes to zero, right? I'm saying, how quickly do I move over here if I walk along a certain direction over here, okay? There's your differential. And we don't need much more to really talk about cauchy riemann equations, okay? So a map is conformal if the following two sequences of operations are equivalent. First, I take my vector and I rotate it by some angle, then I push it forward by the differential. Or I take that same vector, I push it forward by the differential, and I rotate it by the same angle. Right? If those two sequences of operations are equivalent for all points and all vectors, then the map is conformal. This is a perfectly rigorous definition of a conformal map. Okay, well, okay, maybe not perfectly rigorous, but this is really all you need to know. Now, of course, we're trained to not believe that we understand anything formally unless there's lots of symbols attached to it, right? So let's, let's see how we can write down this same idea algebraically in a nice way. And the natural language for conformal geometry is the complex numbers, right? Something that I think people often gloss over, kind of sounds like a, I don't know, funky, esoteric topic. Turns out actually a really nice way to talk about conformal maps. In fact, I would say, you know, the further, the further I go on in life, the more I just always use complex numbers to talk about points in the plane. Why not? Because, you know, a complex number is just a pair of coordinates. I can do all the things I can do with a normal point. Plus, I get one very useful operation, which is I can talk about rotations really easily. Right, so when you go to write code in geometry processing and you're doing calculations in the plane, I would strongly encourage you to use complex numbers, not two vectors, okay? Really simple change, but really will we'll make a lot of things shorter and sweeter. Um, okay, so, so what's this all about? Complex numbers, well, just like in any plane, we, have, we can think about two basis directions. Instead of E1, E2, we're just gonna call them one and I. It's gonna give them some funky names. Otherwise, it works the same way. I can write a point as A plus BI rather than AE1 plus BE2, okay? So far, nothing has changed. The one concept that I think people really struggle with is they show up, you know, on the first day of whenever they learn about complex numbers and somebody says, and the, square, the I is the square root of negative one. And you just, right? What is that? What the heck does that mean? Square root of negative one, who knows? Right? It's complete nonsense. And, and the real trouble with, with explaining I this way is that it emits a very, very simple and, and straightforward geometric interpretation of what I is. It is not, don't think about square roots. Please, I, I beg you to forget this, to never think about the square root of negative one again, okay? Very, very simple thing. I is a thing where if you multiply a vector by I, it just rotates it by 90 degrees in the counterclockwise direction, that's it. I is a 90 degree rotation, okay? So if I take this vector one, 
right? 1 plus 0 i multiplied by i, it rotates to the vector i, 0 plus i. Right? OK, so pop quiz, what happens if I multiply this vertical vector by i? <laughs> it turns by 90 degrees again. Ah, hey. And now I have this interesting equation that says i times i times 1 is negative 1, or i squared is minus 1. Boy, that looks awfully familiar. That looks a lot like, what does that look like? What, what's that? No. It, well, it does. But what does it look like that we saw before? Wait, I thought I told you to forget about that. <laughs> Thank you. Right? OK. So it looks like, you know, it reminds you of the square root of negative 1. But you realize now that that expression has a very, very simple geometric meaning. It just means if I rotate a vector twice, by 90 degrees, it's the same as 180 degree rotation. Or it's the same as negating it. OK? That's what i squared equals minus 1 means. If I hit this thing by i again, OK, I get a vector pointing down. And yeah, I keep on going around. OK, so that's it. So i is a quarter turn in the counterclockwise direction. Oh, and my i is lacking a dot. This is i math, right? <laughs> or iota. Um, once, you have, once you have that intuition about what the complex unit does, kind of everything else about complex arithmetic starts to make a lot of sense. So I can still add vectors just as before. Nothing changed there. And now I just have to think a little bit more carefully about what does it mean to multiply two vectors. We already did one multiplication, which is i times any vector is a 90 degree rotation. What does multiplication mean in general? Well, you can work it out. You know, this is probably what you saw in your high school math class or whenever you learned about complex numbers. You write it out in these rectangular components. You do first in outside, inside, last for some reason that nobody ever explained to you. And then you end up with this AC minus BD is AD plus BC. OK. Um, what does that mean geometrically? <laughs> I have no idea. Right? I look at this. Oh, it reminds me of a determinant. Oh, there's a cross product. Well, OK. Um, Somebody mentioned Euler's identity. Thank you to whoever that was. So another way we can think about complex numbers rather than in these rectangular coordinates, well, we can switch over to polar coordinates. Rather than thinking about the extent along the two axes, we think about the angle that it makes with the real axis theta and the magnitude of the vector r. Right? So I can write my vector as r times cosine theta plus i sine theta. And fortunately, Euler, brilliant mathematician that he was, told us, ah, actually, that whole long expression, you can just boil down to r e to the i theta. So I can replace it with complex exponentiation. Now that's understanding that. There's a lot of interesting and beautiful stuff to say that I won't say. From a very practical point of view, the only thing that really matters is, hey, this is shorthand for vectors in the plane. If I see r e to the i theta, that means I have a vector whose length is r and whose angle is theta. Really nice, compact way of writing vectors in the plane. And makes it really, really easy to do manipulations on vectors in the plane. So let's say I have two vectors in these polar coordinates, r1 e to the i theta 1, r2 e to the i theta 2. If I take their product, oh, well, I'll just use the usual rules for exponentiation. Right? The, the magnitudes in front, oh, those just get multiplied. The exponents, theta 1, theta 2, oh, those get added. So what did I do geometrically? I took vectors that had a pair of magnitudes, and I multiplied the magnitudes. I took vectors that had a pair of angles, and I added those angles. That's all that happens when you multiply two complex numbers. You multiply their magnitudes, and you add their angles. Okay? So just remember that geometrically and forget about the algebra. Yeah? You mean if I was going clockwise? Sure. Um, so actually, this is relevant to conformal geometry of surfaces. You can say, I have something called a linear complex structure, which is essentially any 2 by 2 matrix whose square is minus the identity. So there's a whole family of, the, of such matrices. But they're basically the same up to orientation, as you said. Yeah. OK. All right. So now let's go back to conformal maps. We said, well, we defined this thing. I gave you this very geometric definition. Hey, push the vector forward, then rotate it, or rotate it, then push it forward. If those are equivalent, it's conformal. 
If you're uncomfortable with this, okay, we can write it down using complex numbers. Right? Now that we have this language, we can say, okay, if I have a map from the plane to itself, it's conformal as long as df, the push forward, so pushing the vector forward, applied to a vector x where I've multiplied it by a complex number. In other words, I've rotated it by some amount and scaled it by some amount. If doing that is the same as taking the same vector, pushing it forward first, and then rotating it and scaling it by the same amount as before, if those things are equal for all vectors and all complex numbers, presto f is a conformal map. Okay? Period. Now, one important little distinction here. I keep saying it's conformal. You have to be a little careful. When people say conformal, they really mean one extra thing, which is that no non-zero vector gets mapped to a zero vector. So the map is also non-degenerate. If you allow this kind of degeneracy, if you allow zero uh, non-zero vectors to get mapped to zero vectors, you get what instead is called a holomorphic function. So every conformal map is a holomorphic map. Holomorphic functions are very, very interesting. They can have things like this. They can have little branch points in the middle, right. some point that things wind around. Okay, so I might use those interchangeably or, or switch around throughout the rest. Okay, so, so there it is. So we wrote down the cauchy riemann equations. Now, if you've studied complex analysis before, that probably actually isn't how you saw it, unfortunately. Right? You probably saw something that looked like this, right? Oh, partial derivative of f with respect to x is f2 and then y, and then I know one of the sign flips on one of them, but you have to exchange the x and the y and the right. You know, it's again one of these formulas where, okay, it's right, <laughs> and you can work it out pretty easily, but it completely loses any geometric meaning. And so it's really, really important as you continue through geometry to always think about, can I write things in a way that really reflect the, the geometric meaning? Because then I'll get a deeper understanding of what's going on. What I really want to understand is doing some algorithms, some processing and geometry. I don't want to get caught up on all the coordinates and, and so forth, right? So here I have several different ways of writing down these same equations. I can write it this way. Um, I could also realize, oh, well, if this holds for i, it actually holds for all complex numbers z. Right? Not hard to make that jump. If you know exterior algebra, exterior calculus, you can actually write this out without reference to any particular vector x. Won't get into that. Or you can just write it like this. Oh, a map is conformal if partial bar f is 0. Oh. Right. Well, all this means, this is what's called the cauchy riemann operator. All this means is f is in the kernel of this set of equations. Just shorthand. But they all express the same idea. Right? This is the idea you want to keep in mind. This is what a conformal map is. This is not what a conformal map is. <laughs> this is just one way of writing it down. This is what it really is. OK. All right, so that's pretty abstract. Let's look at some concrete examples of conformal maps. Let's start with kind of the most, the most classic, the most basic uh, example. And this is called a, this is what's called a Mobius transformation. And again, just to to give the visual intuition, this is what it looks like. So I've taken some picture in the plane, and I'm applying a Mobius transformation. And does everybody know where this image comes from, by the way? It comes from the internet, but yeah, MC Escher uh, is the person who, who who drew it or something like it. I don't know if this is if this is a creative license has been taken here. Okay, so so that's what a Mobius transformation looks like, and you can see the characteristic property of conformal maps, namely that angles are preserved. If I look at any angle. Now, these are right angles, those get preserved. And really, really importantly, I can still tell at all times that this is a scary bat, right? <laughs> like, I'm not distorting this or warping this in such a way that I lose, I lose sight of what's, what, what's going on. Things get bigger or smaller, but in any little piece, I can still keep track of, okay, it really looks like the same thing. And I think, you know, that's one reason why conformal maps might be attractive to human beings is because we're used to, you know, if I get closer to Alec, he gets bigger. If I get further away, he gets smaller. Right? If I turn my head, he rotates. But there's not really anything I could do to make Alec sheer. Right? <laughs> I'd, I'd like not to, right? So, so I think that's also why we look at these and we think, oh, they're so beautiful. Well, they just look like you know, what we're used to seeing in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, again, we have this algebraic way of looking at Mobius transformations. Right? We say any complex number z gets mapped to az plus b over cz plus d. Four, okay, I left it out, but four, four complex constants, A, B, C, D, such that this is well defined. Okay. 
what does that mean? What, what, what are Mobius transformations really, or how, do, how can we understand them a little better? And there's this beautiful video made by Doug Arnold and Jonathan Rogness that explains this, whoops, that explains this with some nice soothing music. Oh, come on, where's the nice soothing music? I was there for a second. The narration is more important than the music. Mobius transformations are among the most fundamental mappings in geometry, with applications from brain mapping to relativity theory. A Mobius transformation sends each point on the plane to a corresponding point. They're built from four basic types. The simple translations dilations, rotations, and inversions which turn the plane inside out. Lines on the plane either remain lines or transform to circles and right angles stay true. In general, a Mobius transformation can be a complicated combination of all four effects. The true unity of Mobius transformations is revealed by moving into the next dimension. Taking a cue from Bernard Riemann, we place a sphere above the plane. A light at the top shines through the spherical surface, illuminating the plane. As the sphere moves, the points on the plane follow. When the sphere translates, so does the plane. Raising the sphere gives dilation. Spin the sphere like a top and the plane rotates. Rotation about a horizontal axis corresponds to inversion. Even the most complicated Mobius transformations are revealed to be simple motions of the sphere. Okay, and that's, that's really the point, right? So as funky and strange as this thing looks like when you first see it, at the end of the day, all you're doing is literally doing a l linear transformation in space, in three-dimensional in three space. You're doing rotations, translations, scaling, right? Or affine, I should say, right? But things that are very, very easy to work with. This is, again, why... You know, there's all this beautiful and deep theory behind conformal maps that make these things easy to work with, that give you ideas about how you can deal with these computationally. Um, just to give a little more of kind of the fundamentals here, you know, another really important way to talk about those, those Mobius transformations, does, does everybody know this, this theorem, all rotations of three space or, or n dimensional space can be expressed as an even number of reflections? Right? If I compose an even number of reflections, I get a rotation, but every rotation can be uh, expressed that way. Okay, so Mobius transformations have a similar theorem. They say every Mobius transformation in n dimensions can be ex generated by an even number of what are called spherical reflections rather than ordinary reflections. What's a spherical reflection? Well, the picture, picture says it all. So I, I have some sphere, it has a center C. I measure the distance, if I want to reflect a point X in this sphere, I measure the distance from C to X, and I cook up a new point, X tilde, that's along the same direction as x, but has the reciprocal magnitude, one over the magnitude of x, right? So x gets mapped to x minus c over norm x minus c squared. Same theorem. Every Mobius transformation can be generated by applying an even number of those, right? And uh, 
So, so the reflection itself is not quite conformal. It preserves angles. You have to check. Okay, you have to check that it preserves angles, but it does. And it reverses the orientation. It turns everything inside out. Right? This is another way of uh, understanding Mobius transformations. Also can be understood again from linear algebra. The reason that this, is, this theorem is true is because these inversions are reflections in a higher dimensional space. They're ordinary linear reflections. A lot to understand there. I just want to kind of touch on a lot of these different ideas. Okay, so, so those are some examples of very, very simple conformal transformations in the plane, Mobius transformations. Um, what can we do in general? What's the full scope of conformal maps in the plane? Well, a pretty good way to kind of sum up what's going on is what's called the Riemann mapping theorem, uh, the centerpiece of 2D conformal geometry, which is Let's just read it. Any non uh, any non empty simply connected open proper subset of the complex plane can be conformally mapped to the open unit disk D2. Okay, what does that mean? It means if I have some blob in the plane, no matter what the shape of that blob is, as long as it is disk like, it doesn't have a hole punched in the center, then I can conformally map it to the circular disk. Okay? And I can do that with another blob. I can map that blob to the circular disk. Oh, well, that's pretty cool, because that, what that means is I can get a conformal map from any blob to any other blob by just composing these two maps. If I know how to compute a Riemann mapping of each one, I just compose one map with the inverse of the other. Right? And that's exactly the kind of trick that people do when they want to compare data using conformal maps. Right? If I have two face meshes, I, map them, I could map them both to the disk and try to understand something about the relationship between the two of them. Now, a challenge here is this mapping is not unique. Once I get from here to the circular disk, hey, guess what? I can apply a Mobius transformation. Right? I can rotate it, certainly. And I can also apply some of these more funky motions. Right? Not that many of them, but I can apply these kind of funky motions. So it's not quite canonical. And you have to think about it, a bit about that. Okay, so, so that's it for conformal maps in the plane. We're going to talk now about the perhaps the most interesting case for geometry processing, which is mapping curved surfaces conformally to the plane. Right? So the idea is we have some, some surface, like the head of the bunny. We want to map it in some way conformally to the plane. Or we could generalize this a little bit, and we could say, well, this isn't so different. Okay, the plane is a space of constant curvature, zero curvature. That's not so different than saying I have some surface and I want to map it to the sphere, something else that has constant curvature but now is positive curvature. Right? So, so slightly more general than surface to plane is surface to surface of constant curvature. And there are many, many different ways we can express this mapping right? as a minimizer of this energy or the solution to this equation and so on and so forth. And, and that's kind of what I mentioned before. There's all these different ways of writing down these conformal maps that lead to all sorts of different algorithms. Okay, so again, just some visual intuition. Which one of these is conformal? The one on the bottom, because it's the one that says conformal, uh, but also because you see that right angles are preserved, right? Not up here. Okay, so that's what it means to, for a map from a surface to the plane to be conformal. Curves along the surface that meet at a certain angle, we, th that angle will be preserved. But how do we express this more formally? Well, it, doesn't, it won't look much different from what we did in the plane, but we need just a little bit more language to talk about it. So in the plane, we could easily talk about vectors. Everybody understands what vectors in the plane are. On the surface, probably people have good intuition for what a tangent vector is. It's just a, a vector that just barely grazes the surface, right? If I have a point P, I have a tangent vector grazes the surface. I actually, I guess I won't give a more formal definition. Thank goodness, because I have a lot of other things to say. Okay, but to the tangent plane at a given point would be the set of all tangent vectors at that point. Okay, so what is a what is the differential now? We had a dif the differential in uh, the plane was well, if I have a vector at a point and I have a map that takes a little patch of material to a new patch of material, the differential tells me how that vector gets stretched out. Same idea, nothing changed, right? If I have a tangent vector on a surface and I map that surface to the plane, let's say then the differential is going to say how that tangent vector gets stretched out as I go to the plane. Okay, same setup as before. Okay. I need one more thing to talk about conformal maps on surfaces, which is I need to talk about 
what it means to rotate vectors on the surface. If you remember the plane, I said, OK, conformal means rotation, then pushing forward is the same as pushing forward and then rotating. If I'm mapping to the plane, I still know how to rotate in the plane. I can multiply by some complex number, for instance. But what does it mean to rotate vectors on the surface? Well, I can have, well, this is the question that was asked before, I can have something called the linear complex structure. So I just have a tangent endomorphism. I have a matrix J that when I apply it twice, I get minus the identity. It looks a lot like if I multiply I by I, I get minus one, right? Any matrix that satisfies this property gives me some notion of rotation on the surface. If I'm thinking about you know, concrete surfaces in R3, like we usually do in geometry processing, there's a very natural complex structure, which is I take a tangent vector. If I want to rotate it by 90 degrees, I can just take the cross product with a normal. Right? Keep taking the cross product with a normal. The vector will go around and around and around the normal. Okay? So that's what I mean by J for a surface. And that's all we need to define conformal maps from a surface to the plane. Right? When we were just in the plane, we said df of ix equals i df x. That was one way we could write down the Cauchy-Riemann equation. Cauchy-Riemann equation for surface to the plane, same deal. df of jx is i df of x. Only one letter changed. <laughs> we just had to say what it means to rotate vectors on the surface. Conceptually, nothing changed. Right? So if I, if I have a, a conformal map f, from a surface M to the plane C, what that means is that for any vector X, if I push it forward by df of X and then rotate by I, by 90 degree rotation, that's the same as I rotate by 90 degrees first and then I push it forward. I df of X equals df of Jx. Okay? Really not, not so different. That's why we you know, start in 2D. Concrete example, stereographic projection. So this, we, this is what we saw in that video, right? We're shining the light through the, the, northern, the, the north pole of the sphere. The light is shining through, and wherever it's, the shadow gets cast on the plane, that's, that defines our map, right? If I shine the light from Q to P, P lands on some point on the plane, that defines our map. I claim that this is a conformal map. If you're interested in the subject, you should check it out. Can you convince yourself that it's conformal? How do you do this? You do some ray tracing. If anybody's done ray tracing, you intersect a ray with a plane. Not too hard. Give it a shot. OK. So, so that's, our basic, that's our basic way of understanding conformal maps from surfaces to the plane. Now, there's another point of view that's extremely important and slightly more abstract, which is to understand conformal maps in terms of what's called the Riemannian metric. OK, Riemannian metric is just a really, really fancy way of saying the inner product of vectors on a surface. I have two vectors on the surface. I want to know what their dot product is. That's the, re that's the Riemannian metric. Okay? And it is, okay, I can say the Riemannian metric G is an Im inner product in each tangent space. If we have a Riemannian metric, then of course we can take measurements of lengths and angles and anything that we can usually measure with the dot product. Um, what more can I say? That's it. So for, for surfaces in R3, the Riemannian metric is just, I take the tangent vector sitting on the surface in R3, I use the usual notion of length, the usual notion of angle between vectors. Right? Once we have that point of view of talking about the inner product of tangent vectors as an object, as this Riemannian metric, we get a very, very nice definition for conformal equivalence. We say two metrics are conformally equivalent if they are related by a positive conformal scale factor, a positive scaling at each point P. Right, so if I have an, the, my original metric, let's say the metric of the curved surface, and I have the new metric, let's say the metric once I flatten it out into the plane, how do I know that those are related by a conformal mapping? Well, the change in the metric is just a scaling by some positive number. Okay. Now, before I get into, there's this funky way that I've written my positive number, but why should that be true? You know, why is it that if I take an inner product and I just scale it, why is it that I've preserved angles? Well, let's think about how do we compute the angle between two vectors using an inner product. Right? We take the inner product of the vectors divided by their lengths, and then we take the arc cosine. Right? U dot v is uv cos theta. 
If we want to recover the, ang the uh, angle, we just invert the cosine. So why is it that if I, does, does this, does this kind of make sense then? If I scale up g by some amount, that the angle doesn't change? Now how do I define the length? Length is the inner product of x with itself, square root. If I multiply this by factor 2, right, I get root 2 here, I get root 2 here. Oh, that's a 2, and then I've got a 2 up here. Oh, that cancels, okay? So if I scale my inner product up and down, it doesn't change the angle. It changes, changes length, but doesn't change angle. Oh, that sounds like a conformal map. Changes, changes length, but doesn't change angle. Okay, so that's where this definition comes from. Two metrics are conformally equivalent if they're related just by a scaling at each point. Okay, why am I writing the scaling as this really bizarre function e to the 2u? <laughs> why didn't I just write u for some positive function u? Well, there are a lot of good reasons for this, and if you're going to work with conformal geometry, it's, it's worth being aware of this. this is just what people do. Why? Because, well, for one thing, this is always a positive function. No matter what u is, you could be positive, you could be negative, but e to the u is always positive. Okay, so we didn't change orientation, we didn't flip things over. Um, the factor just e to the u gives the length scaling. So e, e to the u squared gives the area scaling. E to the, e to the u squared is e to the 2u. And uh, it's just a more natural way of talking about distortion. In fact, this, this really matters kind of from an algorithmic point of view. If I want to you know, measure how bad is my map, I don't really want to look at the scaling. I really want to look at the log of the scaling. Why is that? Well, because let's say I take this, this surface and I flatten it out. Some parts grow and some parts shrink, right? Well, I want to penalize shrinking just as much as growing. If something shrinks by a factor of two, that's kind of, in a way, just as bad as something expanding by a factor of two. If I use e to the u, then I'm going to say, oh, well, shrinking is not so bad. It was just a half, right? And uh, expanding is, well, that's four, right, if I expand by a factor of two. If I take the log, they're equivalent, right? Shrinking by a half or growing by two is kind of the same, same amount of uh, distortion. Okay, so, so this is very, very common in, in conformal geometry. We work with a log conformal factor u. Okay, so let's just come back to this. Now we can really say a little more precisely what this uniformization theorem is. Yes. Ah, because e to the u would give the scaling of, scaling of length. It's just, just, for, just for convenience. It's just a convention, right? If we go back here, right? So if I scale g by e to the 2u, then I pull that outside, that'll be e to the u. So e to the u tells me how much length changed, and e to the 2u tells me how much area changed. You could do it as e to the u, but then you'd have factors of one half in other places. Okay, so now we can understand a little bit better this uniformization theorem, right? Or more precisely, what it says is, given a Ramanian metric on any surface, I can find a conformally equivalent metric. I can find another metric that's obtained just by rescaling my metric that also has constant curvature. Hmm, we haven't really talked much about curvature, but okay, you can also read off from this metric how curved the shape is. Constant curvature means same curvature everywhere, like the sphere or the plane. Beautiful theorem. We can always conformally map a surface to one of constant curvature. It'd be very useful. Why is it useful? <laughs> well, because it provides, if we can map to this constant curvature space, that gives us a canonical domain over which we can actually solve some equations. It gives us a domain where we can compare data, we can cross-parameterize all sorts of things. Right? If I want to work with, let's say I want to do kind of Fourier analysis on a surface. Ooh, that sounds tricky. There are ways of doing it directly, but okay, that's tricky. On a sphere, oh, I have spherical harmonics, so there might be interesting things I could do on a sphere. Right? Lots of different reasons why you might want to map to a canonical domain. But you have to be a little bit careful, because just like with Riemann mapping, I still have transformations I can do once I get to that, cano that canonical domain. The domain is canonical, the map is not canonical. Right? So I can get from here to here, it's canonical, but I can still rotate it, apply movies transformations. Same deal here. I can map the, this brain to here, this brain to here, but if I want to align them. Well, I have to think, how do I rotate this? What Mobius transformation do I apply? And so forth. Actually, if you're around this week, we have a paper about this, how to pick a canonical Mobius transformation. Um, that's very useful. But even then, even if you have this canonical map now, 
from your domain to a canonical domain, there's still some shortcomings with uniformization. You know, it's this Achilles heel I keep mentioning. Conformal maps are great. They preserve angles. They do not preserve scales. So if I try to map some shape like this centaur, <laughs> for some reason, to a sphere, all the limbs are going to get compressed down into tiny, tiny little regions on the sphere. And this is going to cause all sorts of headaches from a numerical point of view. Right? You might have scale factors of 10 to the 10. You're shrinking things down horribly. You have bad floating point accuracy. You also have a lot of instability. If I change my map just ever so slightly, oof, I get really bad misalignment along these limbs. Right? So there's still a lot of things to think about there. I think actually this is a big philosophical question um, for geometry processing. Are there other kinds of canonical maps that are useful in the way that, that uniformization maps are, but are kind of better from a numerical point of view? Yeah. Right, same, same idea. So depending on where the noise is, you could really have some problems. Right, absolutely. I mean, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of this activity of, of finding these canonical maps, you're working with integrals over the whole surface. So a little bit of noise doesn't cause too much trouble. But depending on exactly what you're doing, that could cause some, some problems, yeah. Right. OK, so we need, we need ways to think about generalizing this notion of conformal uh, mapping. How am I doing on time? 20 minutes. All right. OK, interesting. Interesting. Well, you know, it's not really important that we get through this, these slides, right? I mean, it's important that people learn some stuff. So, um, OK, so how do we do a little bit better than just mapping everything to a constant curvature space? And here I'm going to say something that's a bit newer. So far, I've been covering stuff that's extremely classic and old fashioned. Let's talk about things that are a little bit newer. So, this idea of cone singularities. OK, what's the idea? This is what I've been talking about. Even in the best case, Right? Even if you have a minimal area distortion conformal map, I can still compress features of the surface down into tiny little areas. And that can be a problem, right? This head might get squashed all the way down, so all the interesting stuff in the face is right there. Oof, not very attractive. And I think this is why actually a lot of people in the early 2000s gave up on conformal mapping and started to do all sorts of other stuff. Well, there's a really nice thing you can do, though. Don't, don't overlook it. <laughs> there's a really nice thing you can do which is you can introduce what are called cone singularities into the, into the mapping. And, and a way, or I think the most intuitive way to think about this is, well, look, the head doesn't look much like a plane, so if I try to map it to the plane directly, I have a lot of distortion. The head does look quite a bit like a box. So how about I try to conformally map it first onto the box? Oh, the box is flat, so I can just, just like a cardboard box, I can cut it open and flatten it. Ah, this map has way less distortion than this one. So I can still say stay conformal, and I can kind of get around this problem of area distortion. I can get over this Achilles heel of area distortion. Okay? So you can think about the Earth this way too, right? Okay, I have the Earth, I want to flatten it out. How do I get a low distortion conformal mapping? And then if you're really greedy, you say, oh, well, I can just keep on adding more and more cones. Or I get it, rather than just mapping it onto a box, I can map it onto a dodecahedron. Now it's really low area distortion. Or I could map it onto a polyhedron with a trillion sides. Now it has really low areas. OK, so you, you realize at some point, well, there's, there's got to be some kind of trade-off here too, which is I want to still keep the, the flattened domain pretty simple. And right? so I want to minimize the distortion. I want to keep the domain simple. How do I do this flattening for some kind of fixed budget of, let's say, cones, meaning the vertices of this polyhedron, or the length of the mapping? Okay, and so this, this has been like kind of a really tough grand challenge problem in geometry processing for many years. Given just the surface, how do I determine the best configuration of cones? Configuration meaning the number of cones, the location of those cones on the surface, and the angle of the cone, how steep is the, the cone? Right? And this sounds like a really hard, from a, from a discrete point of view, from a mesh point of view, this sounds like a hard combinatorial problem to check all vertices, check all possible numbers of cones. Right? So you really don't want to approach it this way. Um, and in fact, there's been a long sequence of papers on how do you find a good collection of cones? How do you find good cone singularities? Yes? Oh, I have four, tri I have four triangles in the end. Yeah, there's the triforce. There's like the triforce of wisdom, power, and uh, whatever the other one is, right? So, th so, so when I cut open the touch region and flatten it out, I have just one triangle. 
kind of like this. Yeah, so, so I'm counting the number of cones as the number of vertices on the, this polyhedron, this target polyhedron. I don't really care how much, you know, necessarily what it looks like here. Right. So, so it's a tough problem. Where do I put these cones, and how big should they be, and, and all this, all this kind of thing. Long series of papers on this. Maybe you just place them by hand. Okay, well, that takes a lot of time. Maybe you do greedy algorithms. Just put, pick the point of greatest distortion, flatten it. Okay, here's another point of distortion. Pick one there, flatten it again. Maybe you use curvature to guide the, where you put the cone singularities. You know, put cones at points of greatest curvature. Well, amazingly enough, it turns out just recently um, that this can be solved by a global convex optimization problem. Not something that was really expected, um, but really makes an enormous difference in practice. When you go from some greedy notion of placing cones to really understanding how to compute optimal solutions, all of a sudden you can get conformal maps. It's kind of like the best of all worlds. They exactly preserve angle. They have very, very low area distortion. And you only have a small number of cones, so you don't have a crazy long cut boundary. You just have a few cuts in the surface, if you know exactly where to place these things. Right, and so here's this really, really simple example. If I don't put any cones on the surface at all, I have all sorts of distortion when I flatten. If I just say, oh, well, I'm just going to put uh, a cone at the point of greatest curvature, that seems reasonable. Actually, not really that great of a strategy. Point of greatest distortion, how about we try that? Mm, not really that great of a strategy. Counterintuitively on this model, the best place to put a cone is in a place that's completely flat. And the reason for that is these cones have a non-local effect. They have a global effect on the solution. Right? Every time I put one of these cones, I'm effectively putting down some function in the scale distortion that has these long tails. So it really, really matters the global arrangement of these cone singularities, not just locally where to put them. And what you discover is if you're able to put these down in an optimal way, you can just put down a very small number of cones and get extremely, extremely close to an isometric mapping. No angle distortion, very low area distortion. Right? So now we're in business. Now conformal maps are really useful for all the things that we want to do, fabrication, uh, texture mapping, machine learning, because they're very, very close to isometry without making totally crazy cuts. Right? And actually, you know, if you think about this a little more deeply, you realize, oh, actually, these cones and cuts you're picking from conformal maps, well, they're not just good for conformal mapping. They're good for any kind of mapping. Why is that? Well. If I've cut my surface up in a way where it admits a near isometric flattening, no angular area or almost no angular area distortion, it doesn't matter what energy I then use, right? If, if there is some near isometric mapping, if I then go and minimize any energy at all, as rigid as possible, whatever it is, I'm going to be able to find a near isometric mapping, right? So, so this is really the power of starting from the conformal perspective. Because the energies are simple, convex, quadratic, Right, things, problems you can really get your hands on and solve in a globally optimal way, you can use that to bootstrap solving much harder problems. And this is a great example of that. So here's another kind of blind taste test. Right, so we have these three models. We've put in some optimal cones. We've cut them up. And then we flatten them using three different energies. One is as rigid as possible energy. One is symmetric Dirichlet energy. And one is just the stupid conformal energy that nobody likes. Right? Which one of these is the conformal one? Uh, left. Okay, we got one. Uh, middle. We got a few. Right. Okay, we got a few. Really, really hard to tell, right? It's the middle one. <laughs> okay, and if uh, if you think that this is just some special example, we have a we, we have a quiz you could take online. You can test test your ability to detect conformal maps. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, you can just barely see. So maybe you can see that this, this quad is not quite square. <laughs> and uh, somewhere you can see some scale distortion in here, I'm sure. And, and likewise, you, there's a few rectang you know, slightly rectangular quads over here. Yeah. OK. Um, Okay, so, so what does this mean? Well, it's, it's kind of cool because if you know just where to place cones and get these really, really flat parameterizations, now you can start working with materials that behave in a conformal way but don't deform very much at all, right? 
you know, these, this is kind of the, the reality of working with physical materials. Yeah, maybe they, they behave in some interesting conformal way, but they still can't stretch all that much. So you still want to know kind of where to put things like uh, optimal cones. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if you're thinking about conformal maps, what does optimal mean? Well, you, you already have no angle distortion, so you don't need to worry about that. So the only thing you could possibly try to minimize is area distortion. So optimal means that you globally minimize the L2 area distortion. There are, of course, with any question of optimality, different objectives you could try. I think the important thing is when you get close to isometry, all of these objectives essentially look the same. Right? Locally, they look, you know, if you do Taylor series, right, they all look kind of the same. So yeah, optimal area distortion. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That is the message. I mean, I think that's the wisdom that we, we're learning, is that how you cut the surface mm -hmm. is way more important than what energy you use to flatten it. And that when you're working in the conformal setting, you have some hope of doing it optimally. Whereas if you're working in some other setting, who knows? Right? Uh, you solve a convex optimization problem and then a linear problem. S so no initials. Like, could it, yeah, so if you have um, symmetries in the geometry itself, of course, there have to be families of solutions. Yeah. So, and so, of course, if you have near symmetries, it's going to be unstable. It's kind of the usual story about all geometric algorithms, right? If, if the surface itself has symmetries, then you get instability. Yeah. Um, so, do we care about the, the degree or the index of this cone singularity as yes. well as the, the number of them? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I kind of skipped over this quickly, but um, that's part of the, the problem, is you have to know how many cones to place, where to put them, and what angle they make. Yeah? Actually, since I'm running low on time, how low on time am I running? Oh, I have 10 minutes. OK. This still might be a good moment, because this is a really good um, way to kind of get an understanding of these cone singularities is we have an algorithm that lets you easily compute maps with cone singularities, which I will run now. And, and it's uh, like, you can seriously just go to this website. I can't, maybe I can, because I have an internet con connection. Let's see. So you can literally go to this website if it loads a little faster. You can click download, and it just works. Right? No installing anything. It just, it'll run. Um, Unless you're on Windows, who knows what'll happen. Uh, <laughs> maybe it'll run, maybe it won't. Okay, so, so here it is. Um, this is a conformal mapping algorithm that we recently developed, and one of the key features is we can very easily place cones. And it's nice because it's, it's very, very fast, which means you can get an intuition for the effect of these cones. So what I'm plotting here is a surface, and this coloring is the area distortion. When I try to just flatten the, the surface naively, there's a lot of distortion in the nose, Right, which has a lot of curvature, and there's a lot of distortion in the chin. And actually, I'm going to turn the wireframe on just for the purpose of being able to see where things are on the plane. So I can just click, and I can add a cone singularity. Oh, it looks so painful. Uh, splitting headache. And, uh, and, but what you saw, I mean, the important thing, I'll turn, the, turn this grid off, maybe. What you saw is the area distortion went down. Right? I split this open, the area distortion went down. Now. As somebody asked, you know, the index of this matters too. If I put some wrong cone angle here, <laughs> right, I can get really bad area distortion. So it is also a matter of picking the right angle, not just the right location. Right, if I put one on the chin, things get better, but again, I have to pick the right angles. Right. Um, if for whatever reason you can't get this working, there is also a JavaScript implementation. So likewise, you go to this page, and you click on the face, and it loads. And the cool thing about this implementation, actually, is because everything's in JavaScript, you can also edit it. You don't have to like recompile this through Emscripten or something, so you can just go ahead. Um, the downside is the implementation's not as great. Like, we don't have all the, all the features, cone singularities and everything. Uh, but you can get some basic conformal mapping. OK? So. Got ten minutes. Uh, 
I have I have Miri's automatic placement in oh not in the JavaScript in the C plus plus we have Miri's algorithm and we will put in our the Optum one uh, it'll be in there soon soon uh, real soon now okay so what else can I what else can I tell you so there's a lot of different things directions I can go maybe I'll say this very briefly because it's very brief <laughs> so we've been talking all about mapping curved surfaces to the plane. That has been really the focus of all <laughs> algorithmic research in conformal geometry. How do I uniformize? How do I take something that's not flat and make it flat or constant curvature? Well, there's another natural thing you might ask is, if I have a surface in space, how do I do a conformal map that leaves it in space, that goes from some curvature, some interesting curvature, to some other interesting curvature? And just like we had the Cauchy-Riemann equation in the plane, there's a fundamental equation for this uh, for surfaces called the time-independent Dirac equation, really not very well studied. So very, very, very recent. Not only has have the algorithms only been developed recently, but even the theory, even the realization that this was an equation that you could solve for this purpose is only from the mid-90s. So this is an area where there's probably a lot more to say <laughs> than in all this you know, 3D to 2D or 2D to 2D stuff, this question of conformal deformations of space. Um, very, very brief taste of this is just like I said, hey, when you're in 2D, you should always use complex numbers to do your calculations. It'll make life easier. I'll say something like that again. When you are in 3D, you should think about using quaternions to do calculations because they do everything that ordinary three vectors can do and they let you do rotations really easily. Why not? Well, quaternions are a little more complicated, but it's still a pretty good story. So, so there's the same link, right? If you want to do conformal deformations in 3D, you can start playing around with quat quaternions. And I'll just come back. Maybe this is a good place to pause. Um, you could also say, well, boy, this is starting to sound really complicated. I have like a Dirac equation and a quaternion. And why don't I just, look, this was stupid. You want to preserve angles? Just preserve the, preserve the darn angles. All right? Optimize the mesh so that the angles are preserved. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. That doesn't work, not even in 3D. Right? Remember we had this case in the, in the beginning. If I just apply similarities to each triangle, then I get this rigidity of the whole mesh, right? Well, same thing's going to happen here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a triangle mesh in R3. I apply some deformation to it, in this case, smoothing. And then I notice this is not conformal, right? I've smoothed it out in some way, but it's not conformal. Some texture maps might have gotten disrupted or something under this process. So it's just fine, fine, no problem. I'll just optimize the vertex positions of this mesh so that the angles are nicely preserved, so that the angles here match the angles here. And as you evolve this process, it's like this creepy thing happens. The armadillo comes back from the grave, the original one from over here. This is the mesh that's closest to this one that has these angles. <laughs> right? In fact, pretty much this is the only mesh that has these angles up to global similarity. Right? This is not a theorem. This is an empirical observation. It is a theorem for convex surfaces. Okay, so you really, really do need to think about conformal maps in a different way. You cannot think about them in terms of just preserving angles. And that is what I would talk about if I had another <laughs> two hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, I should be really, really careful about that. When I say, you know, angles completely determine a surface, this is not quite true. But in a practice, angle preservation is extremely rigid. If you ask for one mesh of the angles of another one, very, very rigid. So not, not the same as smooth conformal maps, which are very, very flexible. Right? But yes, that's, that's absolutely true. It's not, it's not true that angles always uniquely determine a surface. OK, so can I stop for questions here? And then if, if there are none, we can. Oh, and maybe I should say the, the other half of this you can also watch online. So, from last year, we have a video. Okay. Yeah. So, when we want to compare shapes, we usually map shapes to some uh, canonical domain like squares or spheres. But have people tried to uh, treat the shape of the common domain as a variable to optimize instead of constraint? So, for example, mm. we have a collection of animal phases and we want to find the 
optimal phase, which minimize the error of the mapping between the clone phase and other shapes? Yeah, that's a that's a terrific qu question. What is the canonical base domain for a shape collection? And and how do you treat that in all the ways that we talk about in geometry processing? Like maybe you want that, sh you, you know, you want to be invariant to isometries, right? You want an intrinsic canonical domain. There's all sorts of nice questions there. Um, I don't know too much about this. Maybe there's been some done in, in 2D that I'm not uh, kind of just don't know about. I know there's a paper here at SGP, which you should know about because you know about Dirac operators and all this stuff. Um, so they compute something where it's an eigenfunction of the intrinsic Dirac operator. And this provides a roughly canonical domain for uh, any surface. Whether you can really use it in that way for you know all these kinds of applications, I think is an open question. But watch out for that uh, paper. It's not mine, but. Can you just say a little bit about uh, the discrete uniformization theorem that you mentioned? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so this is, this is a really, really important uh, recent result that every triangle mesh, hey, this is, this is a triangle mesh, um, can be conformally mapped to one with prescribed curvature. What does this all mean? Well, first of all, we have to talk about what's a Riemannian metric for a triangle mesh. It was a really fancy sounding concept in the smooth setting. In the discrete setting, a Riemannian metric is just a length per edge. If I know the lengths of all the edges, guess what? I know all about the shape, at least the intrinsic geometry of that shape. Okay. Only thing is those lengths have to be positive and satisfy the triangle inequality. So this is what I would say, okay, this is, this is what a Riemannian metric is, right? It's just the, the lengths. And actually, if you're an intrinsic observer, if you're like an ant crawling along the surface, you can't even really see these edges. Right? These, these two triangles really look flat if you're just crawling along the surface. So really, this is what the Riemannian metric of a, of a discrete triangle mesh looks like. Okay? So what does this discrete uniformization theorem say? Well, we also have to talk about a notion of conformal equivalence. So in the smooth setting, we said conformal equivalence means the two metrics are related by a positive scaling. In the discrete setting, we're going to say the two sets of edge lengths for the same triangulation are related by, guess what, a positive scaling, but one that has a particular form. One where the scaling of an edge is basically the average of scale factors of the vertices exponentiated. Okay? And so then you can ask this question. If I have a given metric, if I have, if I have uh, a given metric and a target curvature, can I find a new set of lengths that's conformally equivalent? What does curvature mean? Oh my gosh. All right. What does curvature mean? It means something like angle defect, which I'm sure I had a slide for before. Uh, it means what's the sum of angles around a vertex? That'll tell you your curvature. If they're too pi, you're flat. If it's very small, you're very curved. If it's very large, you're very negatively curved. Okay. So what you'd like to be true is that for any prescribed curvature, if I've given these edge lengths and I've given a prescribed curvature, I can always find scale factors that take me to these new edge lengths. That is not true in general. If I start out with a very bad triangulation and some crazy curvatures, I may not be able to just rescale those edge lengths and get something conformally equivalent. And this is what people struggled with for a long time from an algorithmic point of view. You try to run this flow and you end up with a degenerate triangulation or something like this. right? So the more recent way of thinking about this is to say, OK, well, we need, if, we, if we're going to make progress here, we have to talk about conformal equivalence of different triangulations of the same cone metric. Right? So if I have these, you know, these two things, you know, these two polyhedra are the same. Uh, well, OK, this polyhedron and the dashed, the one split up by dashed line has the same lengths. The triangulation is different, though. And it's just kind of a superficial change. So how do we talk about equivalence, conformal equivalence of different triangulations? Well, um, one way to do it, which is kind of long-winded, is to say, OK, these two different triangulations of the surface with the same set of vertices are conformally equivalent if I can get from one to the other by either applying a conformal rescaling of the edge lengths and then doing flips and then applying another conformal scaling and then doing edge flips and then applying another one and then doing edge flips. right? That's what it means for two different triangulations to be conformally equivalent. Or we have to go into hyperbolic geometry. We say two different triangulations of the same cone metric 
are conformally equivalent if they induce the same hyperbolic metric on the surface. <laughs> what, what does that mean? Well, if I take any Euclidean triangle, I can put it in its circumcircle in the plane. And weird idea, I can view that circumcircle as the Klein model for hyperbolic geometry. What that does is it turns every triangle of my mesh into an ideal hyperbolic triangle, triangle with vertices at infinity. Okay, so maybe more suggestive to draw it in the Poincaré model. And so now I think about my surfaces being glued together by all these hyperbolic triangles. <laughs> I actually made a picture of this. There it is. <laughs> so this is, a, this is what the, the bunny looks like in Euclidean space. This is an ideal hyperbolic bunny. Okay? <laughs> and, and the point is, if you have two different triangulations that induce the same hyperbolic metric, then they are discretely conformally equivalent. And now we come back to this discrete uniformization theorem that says, in this sense, we can always find no matter how bad the triangle mesh is, no Delaunay condition, nothing, we can always find conformally equivalent metric with prescribed curvature. That's what it says. And this took, took a long time to work out. So there's a series of papers that talk about the, uh, the zero curvature case, the, positive curvature, or the negative curvature case, and then finally the positive curvature case, just last summer. Why, why is it uh, that this discrete uniformization theorem corresponds to, you know, the uniformization theorem that we like from smooth geometry? Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of different connections, uh, which I'd be glad to talk to you about okay. <laughs> offline. But yeah, it, it does in a, in a precise way. The one question that still remains is nobody's proved. As far as I know, convergence on pointwise convergence under refinement, or, or any anything you know like that, that this converges to a smooth map. I mean, this is much more difficult. But now we know that there always is a discrete uniformization. Okay. Yeah, I didn't tell you anything about how to actually compute these things, which actually ends up being a lot more elementary than a lot of these discussions about. <laughs> hyperbolic triangles, so. Well, tell us, thank you, I really want to. Okay. Talk.